your net worth is equivalent to your net worth. If you have a great network, you're going to have a greater net worth. And so even at a younger age in your 20s, this is something that's important that you need to be focused on and building is your network. And how do you do that? There's multiple different ways. I'm not a huge believer about reaching out to people on LinkedIn that you don't know. Almost every single person on LinkedIn that I have, I have a personal connection to or kind of that first degree of separation. And this is a time for you to be brave and to ask others who you really know for their advice and listen and ask for help. So how you build up your network. Welcome to this episode of the Excel Today podcast. Today, we're gonna be talking to Nicole McMacken, who is the CEO and president of Irvine Technology Corp which operates all over the United States, finding CIOs and other information executives jobs in some of the best Fortune 500 and Fortune 300 companies in the world today. Nicole's gonna be talking about how she found her path to being the CEO of Irvine Technology Corporation. She's gonna be talking about some of the serendipitous wins and uh, forks in the road that she found throughout her young life. She's gonna talk about hard work and she's gonna talk about women in business in a different way than maybe you've heard before. Um, Nicole is a leader in promoting women in technology and developed curriculum to educate female executives through UCLA and UC San Diego, the Women in Business Certificate Program. She's an active member of the Orange County community, serving on numerous boards and has received many national and local awards, including congressional recognition. She sits on numerous advisory boards for hospitals and schools and shines as a leader in business. Welcome to the show, Nicole McMacken. All right. Welcome, Nicole McMacken. As we always start off the show, I wanted to start with your definition of excellence. So, Nicole, let me know what your definition of excellence is. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm super excited to be here. Um, my definition of excellence would be for myself to continuously be building inner strength to overcome life's challenges. I think as men and women um, and human beings, we have a tremendous amount of challenges always reoccurring ahead of ourselves. And to to muster the inner strength to be able to deal with those and know that you can accomplish anything at any time is what I would define excellence as. Wow. Well, you have a, uh, a really interesting uh, career. You've done a lot of things. And as all business people have, you've encountered a lot of different obstacles. So has that definition of excellence changed over time as you've hit different roadblocks? That's a great question. Um, it. It certainly has. I think, you know, to be upfront, I'm 48 years old. Um, I took over and started running my business when I was 29 years old. And my definition of excellence, I think if you would have asked me as a teenager to a person in my 20s to my 30s, probably would have been much different. It would have been, um, I guess, just based on different goals and things and different outlooks that I have. You know, I think as you become older and wiser, as they say, you start looking at things a little bit differently. And for me to have expertise and an inner strength to withstand and overcome and, and help others would now be my definition of excellence. Again, you know, it could have been very, very different, I think, in my teens and in my 20s. I think it's, it's different for everyone. All right. Let's go back to when you started to excel um, back maybe high school and college. And why don't you tell us and our listeners what was life like for you in high school and college before you really knew what you wanted to do for a living? Maybe before you were excelling compared to your peers. I don't know what your life was like in high school. What was it like in high school and college for you? So I was one of those kids that always knew what I had to do um, my whole life. And that was to become an attorney. I am not. And so I set off in a direction because I think the challenge oftentimes is that you know what is around you. So if you're surrounded by parents, aunts and uncles, et cetera, who come from a legal background, you're going to be an attorney. If there are dentists, typically that's the world that you know you're going to be a dentist. 
And so my life was really focused on, okay, I grew up in a family that had two full-time working parents who also owned their own businesses, but were really from an ethnic background. My mother is Italian. My father is uh, Mexican and um, owned their own businesses, but really saw them throughout their career standing up for more disadvantaged um, individuals. And so from there, at a young age, I decided that I wanted to help women. And I would be a litigator to help women and, and help the environment and, and do all these, these different things. And so I was one of those kids that thought my, you know, up until really after college, that I was going to go to law school and be a litigator. And um, in high school, you know, I was very, very driven always. I came, as I mentioned, from a background of two working parents who worked very, very hard. I was a um, kid that always had to um, have nothing handed to them. I always had to work. So during the summers, I had, you know, starting at 15 years old, I had a summer job the entire summer um, at school. When I was in high school, I had um, to work after school five days a week and sometimes on the weekend. And so a lot of my peers and, and friends in school did not do that and, and, and did not have to work. And I think what attributed my success over time was that I had a very, very strong work ethic to watching and being involved in both of my family businesses. And I think that really helped propel my career is the ability to get in and work with people of different ages and assimilate into different environments versus staying with the same group in high school and um, kind of doing the same thing that everyone else was. Wow. So uh, the audience may not know this, but uh, Nicole and I have known each other for quite a while and served on a couple boards together. I didn't realize that you went to college to be an attorney. I also went to college to be an attorney. In one of our other Excel Today podcasts, we actually talk about the DISC test. And it's my theory, and I've, I've asked a lot of college students, how many careers a college student knows is about 25. And they always know, like you say, the surrounding careers in their life. You know, the careers on TV. And so you end up having a lot of people go into just a few industries that maybe aren't the best for them. Like for me, I don't think I would have been a great attorney. Maybe you would have been, but I didn't know about entrepreneurship as a young person. I, you know, I sure didn't know about uh, technology recruiting when I was young. Um, interesting that you, you followed the same path. Now, you also follow the same path as me uh, in that you had a lot of summer jobs and you always worked hard. And I think that's great. Uh, you and I both have children. There are some kids out there that uh, might have had a little bit of a different upbringing to you and I. So you and I are out getting it out, developing a work ethic early. So I hear in your answer. Well, I, I would I would say this, right? And um, for those those kids out there who who may be listening to this, and I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart. We together through college and got married right after. And he was brought up very differently than I was. He was an athlete. And so he ended up going and playing at US and ended up later on getting recruited by a major league baseball team, but and did not play, by the way. But um, I wanted to say that for those athletes, you know, you are learning a lot of those things being on a team and the commitment level that it takes like it would work to be showing up on time, to be giving your all, to be delivering customer service to your coaches, to your teammates. And you're learning a lot of different attributes that both Matt and myself learned out in the field working at corporations at a young age. All right, so let's take it one step further. Um, and, and we're gonna get back to your history in a second. You go through uh, high school, maybe you don't develop that work ethic. Maybe you weren't a varsity or a world-class athlete. Um, you, you find yourself in college, maybe you, uh, uh, miss some of those opportunities. Maybe your parents enabled some of that and you're wanting to get started now. Um, any advice for someone that did, didn't have that kind of drive and that maybe not crystal clear awareness of where they wanted to go, but at least awareness they wanted to go far and didn't know what to do or didn't execute on what they needed to do in high school. Yeah, I'm sorry, Matt. And they're they're just entering into college now. Is that? Is I mean, they're in their 20s. They realize that they didn't work that hard. They missed a few opportunities, but uh, it's not too late. Any advice for them? 
They can't they can't join a varsity sport now. So what are they doing? Okay, so they're they're out of college potentially? Yeah, either in college, out of college. Okay. And I know Matt hasn't talked a little bit about my background and what I do, but I help people find jobs essentially uh, in the technology field. So this question, you know, does come up often. So what I would say to those individuals, if you are in college, it is mandatory that um, you go out immediately and find an internship, an internship program that is a free internship, or it could be a paid internship for you, but you're going to need to demonstrate some type of, unless you're, again, which Matt had alluded to um, in the sports realm, going to need to show some type of history in a corporate organization. It could even be during the summers if you have time. It could be donating some of your time and working on behalf of a charitable organization, but you need to have some type of documented um, work experience where you're working with others under the direction of you know, some type of either an entity or corporation. If you were out of college, then you're probably looking for a job. And let's say that you didn't have a vast amount of, of work experience previously. My advice would be to you, um, kind of my number one saying when people ask me what is, what is most important in attaining a, a great job, and, and I say it's your network. Um, to me, your network is equivalent to your net worth. You have a great network. You're going to have a greater net worth. And so even at a younger age in your 20s, this is something that's important that you need to be focused on and building is your network. And how do you do that? There's multiple different ways, you know, and I, I'm not a huge believer about of um, reaching out to people on LinkedIn that you don't know. Almost every single person on LinkedIn that I have, I have a personal connection to or uh, kind of that first degree of separation. And this is a time for you to be brave and to ask others who you really know for their advice and sit and listen and ask for help. So how you build up your network. That's a great answer. So let's go back to uh, um, your path. You're going off to become this attorney and all of a sudden you steer off of that course. How did you find your path and how did you end up at 29 years old running Irvine Technology Corporation and at 32 years old on the Inc. 5000 list? So um, a little bit different, probably a lot like most of the people that are, will be listening to this podcast. Um, I fumbled into this industry. So basically what happened is, um, as I had spoken to you about earlier, my high school suite at heart and I are married. We went through college together. He was at USC. I was at UC Irvine. And then he proposed to me while I was on my way going up to law school uh, in Spokane at Gonzaga. And um, my parents then did not want me to get married. I was 22 years old at the time. And so to discourage that, knowing that I was hell bent on becoming uh, attorney, they said, well, we'll pay for law school or, you know, we'll pay for a wedding, but we're not going to pay for both. And so um, part of my personality being stubborn as it, as it is, I said, great, I'm going to get married. And um, to their dismay, uh, they did not, they held true on their promise. They did not my law school and I did not relocate up to Washington. And so now I found myself back working in the family business, my mother's family business, which was private schools. And I was in Simi Valley, California, and my husband's uh, business, family business, and he worked for, was in Orange County. And so I was driving to get to work at 4.45 in the morning on the road. And it would take me a couple hours to get there and two to three hours to get home driving every day. And I did that for a few years. And then I decided I didn't have a JD degree. And um, what was I really now capable of doing? And so I, it was time for me to stop driving the crazy roads. And um, I went to a headhunter and asked them, what am I now capable? I don't have my master's degree. Um, I, I don't have my law degree. So what, what could I really do? I've been working in the private school industry. And um, they said, gosh, why don't you come and work for us? And you could be a business development representative. And I kind of laughed. And I said, I've never done sales in my life. I go, are you kidding me? And they said, we think you're going to be great. And so I went home and I took 
$24,000 a year when I was making at the time 56,000 a year, which wasn't a lot, even at that time. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to take this job and I am going to work and do my very best. But my main job is companies and talk to their human resources. And I'm going to find out every company in Orange County and I'm going to meet with their human resources um, representative and I'm going to sell myself if I like the company. And within six months, I was this company's that I went to, their top sales executive. And they were already looking at me for management positions and I loved the industry. And it was ever evolving and ever changing. And I really loved the technology segment of it. And it was the rise of, you know, Y2K and all that kind of stuff, dating myself. But um, I became very interested in it and I, I loved it. I was making a, a quite a bit of money and um, I was meeting a lot of different people, things that I like to do, being an extrovert. And so I kind of fumbled my way in so many people at, at, in college, right? They, you know, and I sat on the board for a while at UC Irvine um, as a representative to the chancellor. And um, I would constantly meet with deans there. And this is after, after um, this is in my, in my business world, not while I was a student. And I would say, you know, why is there not courses that bring corporations into the university that outline if you're, you know, you do a disc test and these people are strong in marketing and um, finance and accounting, or these people are, you know, more heavily focused on engineering and show them the corporations and have them come in and say, these are all the different jobs that lead to these types of things and benefits and salaries. And, you know, they're, their rebuke was always that we're an academic institution and it, we're not focused on, you know, people's careers after the fact. And so my reply was always like, you're the only, you know, corporation essentially, because universities are corporations that don't manage their assets after they let them walk out the door and you have no, no trail of them. But, but, you know, like many of you, I think we all just end up going into some type of sales career, unless we have a master's or, some type of um, JD or doctorate or something from the fact after the fact. So that that's interesting. So there's so much serendipity in there and so many different forks in the road. And as you were talking, I was thinking about work ethic versus and perseverance versus picking a different path. So you start talking about your life and you said, you know, you're young, you're always working, you're always working. You give the advice, if you're not already always working in college or high school, get started, always working, always working, get the momentum going. And then you have this plan to be a litigator and the parents throw this serendipitous fork in the road, marriage or litigation, you choose marriage. And all of a sudden you go that way. So it's easy to see why you would choose that route. You're gonna go marry your high school sweetheart, but then all of a sudden you're going down the road again. And you could have probably figured out how to get loans or go to law school or something, but you take the sales road and you're going down that road and you take the IT road and then you're going down that road and eventually you get the CEO road. So help me understand how you balance, you know, you have your drive and your plan to be a litigator and you're very focused and you're very goal oriented. How are you able to be goal oriented to be driving for excellence today, to be moving in the right direction and see these branches and make them turn into such wonderful, you know, different paths. Or maybe it's just, hey, if you would have been a lawyer today, you'd be a great lawyer and everything would be the same. What do you think? I think um, that's a great question. I think that for me, work ethic is everything. It's everything and it should, it's the things that I look at most that people could bring to our to our organization, I look at my own children and I evaluate them based upon their work ethic, right? I, I don't want people to be lackadaisical. I them to, to uh, even my own children, to push off their responsibilities onto us. Um, it's important as human beings that we're all accountable for our own actions and we're always doing our best and always trying to put our you know, best foot forward in the work organization, our personal lives, et cetera. And, you know, how I got to, you know, you talk about balance in life and and career, right? A little bit, you were mentioning, um, you know, you're so driven in this one area and then you quickly move over and, you know, do you find a a balance in one area or the other? Or, and I think your life is not balanced for a long period of time. I do think there is something that's going to suffer. So, for I do not believe that a person can have it all. I think at different points in times, you have what you want most at that period of time. 
Um, and then you kind of, you kind of drift off and those change, right? There's a pair shift. It changes with you. It changes with your persona, what you want most for me, you know, I, I believed that whatever situation I was in, I was always going to do the best and be the best, very competitive personality. And, um, you know, when I went to that staffing company, even though I, in my mind was utilizing it to kind of know the area in Orange County and potentially place myself somewhere at a different company, I made sure that I opened up the office every day at 6.30 in the morning. So I was the one that opened it and I was the one that closed it every day too. And then I would go home, have dinner and I would write my thank you notes for my business. I'd print flyers out. I do all these different things. And I always wanted to be the best in the top and give my professional outlook and effort, should I say, um, to everything that I do. And so, so I think that to your point, Matt, if I, if I was a litigator, I know I would be very successful doing that because I believe that I would take that same mantra and put it through whatever I do. Yeah. I, I wonder. So uh, I know I would not have been a great attorney, but I wonder with you, just interesting, uh, you know, the work ethic, uh, the competitiveness, but the openness to these opportunities that are out there that just kept coming. And it's interesting to think about, you think about perseverance and we push people to persevere, but eventually you got to stop persevering and make a different, make an adjustment and go down a different path, like the law career, maybe. Or maybe but don't you think, don't you think in life, right, that, that that is what life is. You are every new doors are going to be open to you, and you're very selective and use your best judgment on where you can excel, and where you can see yourself. Same thing, you know, with business and business decisions, right? There's going to be new doors and opportunities that open all the time for you, and you're going to decide that good opportunity for business for me as a person, as an individual, I'm going to take it and. and you know, I, I was offered many kind of an very varying, uh, in, when I went into the staffing industry, um, a lot of opportunities, one of them was presented to me was to work for one and, um, sell media and advertising with an area. And I explored that. I went down path to see if that was something really that I felt like I could do. And um, I decided to stay within the industry that I'm in, um, but I, I know I would have been successful in that industry as well. And it was just a choice, happenstance, that, that I decided at the time, no, I'm not going to take this opportunity. I'm going to go down this. All right. Um, well, we're going to shift gears in one second because I want to spend a little bit of time on your Women in Business Initiative. I know you've done a lot at the at UCLA and in the California community. I know you've been recognized I, I think even by Congress. Um, but before we get there, now that you've you know uh, been a professional for a little bit, um, now you're a little bit later in life, anything that surprised you about how life is for you today compared to where you thought it would be in your early 20s? What's different than what you thought? So I, you know, it's funny that you say that. So, you know, my husband and I worked very, very hard in made a lot of different sacrifices that a lot of our peers did not make because we were both so goal oriented. And so while other people, you know, were doing different things time and maybe having a great time and, and going to different places and traveling all over the world. And, and we weren't, we, we were very young. We got married very young. Um, we son eight or later, I believe. And we put our careers first and where a lot of people at our age were getting married then in their thirties, they were touring around all of Europe and backpacking and, and having an opportunity to do, do those things. Um, but what I think is very different was that we were working so hard. If I, can, I can't even explain to you how hard, I mean, you know, we were in debt and had to sell one of our cars and figure out how to get us both to work. I mean, it wasn't always glamorous. And then you reach your goal and um, that you had set out for yourselves. And, and what we would do is um, we would draw a picture actually of where we would be each year. And it was funny because we just sold our house and we pulled out this picture and it was from when we were very young and um, we looked at it and, you know, it was to have a house and a pool and two children and a dog and two nice cars. And we were just kind of laughing. I mean, it was when we were in our 20s. And uh, what surprised me most is that it's the getting there. It's the working to get where you want to be that is actually good stuff. Is that where our memories were really built? 
and the times that we really right was remember that you know we had to sell that car and do you remember we had to get drive borrow someone's minivan and I would drive that back and forth and you know or oh gosh remember we had to sleep on the floor and you know just the hard parts of getting there I think looking back it was it was the most fun you know and now you have you know you have these things and and it's great right and, and it's great and it's nice but you know, it's, it's not like it was, and it, um, you just, you just don't have as fond of memories, I guess. So I guess that was the most surprising. So interesting answer to my question. So basically you had your vision boards and you had your dreams and you and your husband, um, sat around and thought, what if, what if it all worked out? And it seems to have worked out exactly as you wanted it to, um, no surprises in the end result. The surprise is that you really valued and enjoyed the process uh, which I think I talked to you before about karma yoga that I took from Sanjay Kapoor. Um, you also remind me of the rule of 72. I know you're a good investor. We won't talk about that today. We won't talk about uh, how good you are at investing assets. But the rule of 72, you know, your, your money doubles uh, based on dividing the interest rate into 72. If you invest early, you have a lot more money due to compound interest late in life. And you know, we, they teach kids in college about investing in retirement early. Kind of what I heard you saying was you and your husband invested in your life early and everybody else. And I heard you say it. and I know what you meant. They're taking two years off to go on walkabout in Europe. They're going to go live the van life for a few years and then get started with life later. You got it done real early and maybe maybe felt like you were paying a price at the time. But now um, you're able to, we're not talking about it. You know, you've got your financial success, but you're able to donate time to all these boards you belong to and all these organizations that you help with uh, because you invested early. And let's move right. into that. Let's move into that for a second. Um, so let's talk about women in business. So our audience is uh, women and men. Um, you and I both know that about 12% of the executives in the United States are women, 3% worldwide. Uh, however, the population isn't that divided. Uh, I'm going to ask you some interesting questions. What do you do that's unique because you're a woman and a CEO in business that I don't have to do just because I'm a man? So I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I hope I think your listeners will find it. So this is this is an example. It's better for me to give you an example than actually try to explain it. So I was hired by uh, a Fortune 500 company to go in and what my company was to do a lot of different things on the IT side. So they had seen that I had quite a bit of different experience in regards to executive leadership. And it's very common for technology leaders, let's say, and business leaders to not get along or not understand each other or what each other's desires are for the business and the outcome. And so they had hired me to come in and what would be then called the um, monthly leadership. And so I was brought in to basically be a mediator and a facilitator between the business executives and the IT executives in this large corporation. And so I had walked in and it was a financial institution, so not a lot of women in finance and the leadership side of things, nor are they on IT. So I had walked in the boardroom. It was a big, beautiful boardroom with windows surrounding. I mean, it was, it was outstanding. And there was like 35 or 36 seats. And um, I had walked in. It was all men. And, you know, half of those seats were filled up. And so I, you know, got up and I, I introduced myself and I got up to the whiteboard and I kind of explained what we were going to be doing and some challenges that we were going to be addressing. And at the end of the hour, two gentlemen had approached me and they had said, wow, said, that was really, really great. We were not expecting that. That, that was fantastic. And for those of you, you know, who can't, who can't see me, I have blonde hair. And so I looked at them. And I put a big smile on my face and I said to them, I said, well, gosh, I said, you know, thank you. I said, I don't, I don't know if I should thank you or, or be in, I said, and they said, no, 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 wait, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, no, I said, one day 
you're going to see a woman, a blonde woman walk into a presentation. I said, and you're not going to feel compelled to say you weren't expecting that. And so that, Matt, is a little thing that I wanted to share with your listeners of what women or myself, even at an executive level, who's an accomplished individual, deal with is the expectation that you're not going to be great. And that's the challenges that I see. And that's the challenges that I experience. So what advice would you have for a young 20 year old before they encounter that? Is there a way to avoid that? No, there's no, there's no way of avoiding it. But I think and I believe that in a kind way, to be able to to way that I did it, and we're dear friends, both those gentlemen and I still to this day, um, to be able to call out some of the behavior, right, to be able even on the sly or on the joke and say, hey, one day I'm going to come and walk in here and you're going to expect and notice that they're they're going to be great and and you know even in a financial institution where it's all men, um, you know we're we're here we have we have we're fifty three per population and we have we're smart and we have something to say so I guess I would um, be very careful on but I perhaps would bring some attention and notice to it. All right. So uh, what else is is still holding women back in business? I know you have a program that you started at UCLA. Maybe maybe talk to us for a second about the program at UCLA and uh, what you're trying to accomplish with that program at UCLA. Sure. And um, if you'd like, I can answer the question on what they're holding them back. Uh, they're, women are holding themselves back. It's not um, that men are pushing pushing them down or there is a, a glass ceiling. Certain, maybe certain circumstances there are. But through um, a program that Matt alluded to that I'm at UCSD, as well as UCLA, I've done a tremendous amount of research about women's behavior as it relates to self-promotion, uh, as it relates to applying for different opportunities as a corporation that's diversity certified, where um, small, mid-sized, and large companies come to you on a daily basis asking for diversity. The challenge is not that they are not available, um, it, there's in the market, even on the technology side, the challenge is that women don't apply because they lack the self-confidence to do so. Hmm. Interesting. Um, talk to me. Uh, one time I, I heard you speak on the percentage of times women are interrupted compared to men. And I don't know where I heard you say that, but I remember hearing you say that. And I paid attention to that since then. And I've noticed that, uh, uh, women are interrupted much more than men in a boardroom. And I don't pay attention so much socially, but in the work environment. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that? And how can uh, women address that? Yeah, I um, that is true. And it, it is funny because I was um, before COVID at a large conference and uh, the chief information officer at a very large, um, well-known uh, studio media company had actually spoke to that. And she had spoke about when women are in the boardroom, even if they're in charge of the meeting, they're interrupted more than men would be and, uh, or passed over or glanced over. And, you know, again, when I spoke a little bit earlier about this, it's to bring it to people's attention. It's, it's something that is non-intentional but that once you see it and you call for it and, and you look like you do now, Matt, you, you probably recognize it more often now that someone's told you about it. It's not something, it's an unconscious bias. And that if you just allow people um, in a kind way and they'll go ahead and take that recognition. I think we all, we all have unconscious biases and I have my own. Matt, you have your own, everyone does. And if people just bring it to our attention, that's how we begin to change the world and to change people's perceptions. And so just by, by calling it out in a professional way. Great. Uh, so we're gonna start to wrap it up and I want you to just uh, close us out. Uh, I've got two more questions for you. First one is looking back at your life uh, when you were starting off, and you may have already hit it. What sacrifices did you make? that you never regret, that you are so happy that you had made. And the second thing, 
what are you going to do in the next three months to make yourself more excellent? So we'll start with the sacrifices you never regret. The sacrifices I never regretted was not holding myself back and um, out of fear. I think many people tend to run their lives around fear. And I didn't allow myself to do that. I had to believe in myself and know and trust myself well enough to know that I can accomplish any goals that I set out for myself. And that I believe was one of the things that was most important to me. Of course, you know, having children and having um, the ability to make in my schedule that I could be there and serve on their boards of the school and I could coach their soccer games. That was something I never regret, you know, or, or, or giving up. Great. And what are you doing in the next three months to keep up your record of excellence? Well, I just recently, I had a business partner um, and I recently purchased him out and I'm growing the company, which I'm super excited about. I'm continuing with my program of teaching at UCLA and UCSD and taking that on a national level to better help and prepare women for to be executive leaders in the workforce. And, you know, it, it's important to me to, to, to be a great mother to my, to my children and instill the values that we're discussing today and the stories to my own kids. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, for appearing on the podcast. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt. It's been great to be here.